Nikki Hockley is today's presenter. Nikki is Director of Pedagogy at the Consultancy and as a teacher, trainer and author, she's a specialist in technology and has written numerous books, articles and blogs on the subject. Nikki is a con contributing author to the Cambridge Guide to Blended Learning for Language Teaching. So, over to you, Nikki. Thanks very much for that introduction, Charlotte, and hello everybody and welcome. And I see we have an amazing range of countries there in the chat box. And I noticed that, you know, very much like the British are famous for, everybody is talking about the weather. So I guess I better tell you where I am and what it's like. I'm in Barcelona in Spain and it's a beautiful spring day. In fact, the daffodils are out in the garden and it's probably about 20 degrees in the sun. So I'm sorry if that makes people in Northern Europe feel jealous, <laughs> but this is why I live here. It's absolutely glorious at the moment. Okay. Um, I see some familiar faces in there as well, or familiar names rather, um, welcome, and some new names. And I'm guessing that we have uh, 187 attendees at the moment, uh, probably because there is a growing interest in blended learning. It's one of those things that's kind of crept up on us. Um, you know, we, we all probably thought when we first heard about it that it had nothing to do with us. But I think more and more schools and more and more teachers are starting to consider uh, blended learning, what it might mean, how they can actually put it in practice in a principled way. And this is the aim really behind this session, to try and kind of unpick exactly what blended learning is and then think about how it can be put into practice. And I'm hoping to give you some sort of guidelines or some tips or at least some questions to ask yourself um, about blended learning as we go along. Okay, well, when we're talking about new things and new terms, probably the first thing we do is, um, you know, look at a definition. So I'm going to hand that over to you. See if you can complete that sentence. Blended learning is, and just type a few words or a sentence in the chat box, and we'll have a look at how we all define blended learning as a group. It means we'll have to stop chatting about the weather for a second. Right, so Alan is, Alison is then in there, first off the mark. She says, blended learning is a mix of IT and a normal classroom. Okay, so technology plus classroom. Keely there says a mix of face-to-face -face and online. Teresa, just under that, is saying learning, learning at a distance. Joanna says a mix of something. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're seeing here mix, combination, online, offline face-to-face -face and technology. Okay, Elena's saying they're a mix of traditional learning and online learning. Okay, and Deborah's saying different methodologies of teaching. Okay, it seems like most people are referring to the idea of a mix of face-to-face -face and online or a mix of face-to-face -face and some sort of integration of um, technology. Although Alison there is likening it to whiskey. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at a couple of definitions and you'll see that you're pretty spot on there. So the first one there, the first definition, a mixture of both face-to-face -face and online learning. Some elements are delivered online and some are delivered face-to-face. -face. I think that was the most common definition that we saw there in the chat window. But then again, there's a second definition which is perhaps a little bit broader from Sharma and Barrett, this idea of a, 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 an appropriate balance between face-to-face -face teaching and technology use, which means that you could integrate the technology into the face-to-face -face classroom. And then under that, there's a couple of terms that people sometimes use when they're talking about blended learning. So hybrid learning is a word you may have heard, uh, this idea of web enhanced. And related to all of this is the idea of the flipped classroom, which is also often brought into the kind of package when we talk about blended learning. But I'm going to come back to the flipped classroom in a minute. I think most commonly, though, we refer to blended learning, certainly in our profession, in English language teaching. Yeah, Christina says, don't like hybrid. I don't either. It's not that commonly used, I don't think, certainly in our profession. OK, uh, there's a question there at the bottom of the slide. What experience do you have of blended learning as a teacher or perhaps even as a learner? I'll just give you a minute there to type a line or two in the chat window if you do have any experience so we can see what we have. Okay, so 
Nisha, they are saying uh, new materials and class discussion and then online practice to boost existing skills. Lovely. OK, I think that definitely fits the definition of blended. We've got Danielle talking there about virtual classrooms. OK, some people say they don't have so much. Some people are using online course books like Touchstone and Viewpoint. OK, uh, Sarai there, she says she gives her students a uh, web quest. OK, using platforms. All right, using WebEx there, we have uh, Michelle talking about WebEx, which would be like a synchronous video conferencing platform like this one. OK, Saima is talking about iPads. Interactive material from Stephanie, perhaps related to the interactive whiteboard. Brian is mentioning a MOOC, which would be an online, massive, uh, massive online um, course. OK, some people are using videos, WebEx, Moodle, Blackboard. OK, so there seems to be a fair amount of experience in the group. Brilliant. OK, and a variety of platforms as well being used by people. OK, and we'll come back to your experience in a little while. Um, hopefully, you can share a little bit more detail of what you do with your students. OK, so of course, the first question is when you're thinking about starting with blended learning, uh, the first question to ask is why? And on the slide, there is a list of some of the kind of typical uh, reasons that people might decide to include blended learning in their classes or in their institutions, right, at a school level or at a university level. Obviously, the first one is cost. And I put that at the top because it is often a major consideration at institutional level. A university or a large school may decide to start offering part of their courses online so that they save costs in terms of teaching time, classroom spaces freed up, and so on and so forth. The second one I think that's most often cited is this idea of um, the competitive advantage. So if my school is offering students blended learning, then maybe it's a little bit better than the school down the road. There's that kind of perceived idea of value. And these are all things that we can question, by the way. I'm just putting them out there as reasons that are often cited. Um, another reason is the third one there, the idea that we do the kind of mechanical learning at home of students, do the mechanical learning at home. And by mechanical, what do you think I mean there? What, what do you think mechanical learning is in terms of English language teaching? OK, so we have the drills, grammatical accuracy, rote learning, yeah, grammar type exercises, consolidation, yeah. Because, you know, part of language learning is, you know, you do need to memorize some of that vocabulary, don't you? So the idea is that that can be done uh, by students at home, perhaps online. OK, so sort of rote learning stuff. Of course, that's not what language learning is all about, right? That's just one part of it. Uh, and then the idea, the flip side of that, if you like, is that we do the communicative activities in class. So we free up time. And I'll come back to that. That's the, the flipped classroom model. This idea of having exposure to authentic English at home through the internet, obviously, YouTube videos, uh, texts, online texts, websites, and all the rest of it. So we can give our students plenty of kind of listening and reading material that is authentic, that is uh, not written for language learners. Then the next point there is this idea of working at your own pace through the material, often cited as a great benefit for students. Slower students will take more time. Uh, more proficient students will work faster. Uh, this idea of access from anywhere, anytime, on any device, so the, the sort of overall idea of flexibility. You could be doing your grammar exercises on the bus on your way into work, for example. Not quite sure whether that actually happens, but that is cited as an advantage. Um, the point after that, uh, that in our online materials, we usually will have a range of media. And by that, I mean uh, audio, video, text, images, and so on. And that this can cater to learners' different learning styles. Um, and then the sort of second last point there, uh, that students can work more on their weak areas. So if they're having problems with a particular grammatical point, they can spend more time doing online activities around that particular area and hopefully getting it sorted out. So my last point there is other. I wonder if there are any other reasons why people do blended learning that maybe I've missed in that list or any reasons that you've been involved with blended learning that I haven't thought of. 
Okay, Lorraine has put there the idea of self-directed learning. Yeah, uh -huh, okay. So that if you're a self-directed, fairly autonomous uh, learner, perhaps that's another good reason. You know, the kind of idea of autonomy. Simon's saying to reduce teacher talking time. Yeah, so students uh, get more chance to produce in theory. They can work in smaller groups. Okay, we've got the autonomous point there from Lyndon again. Yeah, and they can have contact with the rest of the world. That's Alison. Bit of variety, fun. Right. Okay, learner training helps the Google generation. That's nice, Stephen. Yeah, the idea that perhaps the students are quite used to doing stuff online. Motivation, possibly. Using technology. Removes fear and inhibition there from Muhammad. That's a good point, and we're going to come back to that one uh, in a little while when we look at some of the research. Okay, and maximizing, Michelle is saying they're maximizing student learning time, absolutely. And also perhaps that uh, students spend more time being exposed to English than they would just by being in the classroom. Great, okay, so lots of fairly good reasons uh, overall, I think. Let's move on. So obviously when you, you've decided that you want to start using blended learning either as an individual teacher with say a class of students or a couple of classes or whether you're an institution and you're trying to put together some kind of strategic approach to blended learning the first step is always this one it's defining your terms so in this case what kind of blended learning are you talking about are you talking about this idea of a mix of face-to-face -face plus online outside the classroom or are you talking about that second definition that we had before, which is the idea that we're integrating technology even into the face-to-face -face classroom? So you first need to get that straight, exactly what you mean by blending, and then why are you doing it? So what are the aims? What are you trying to give your students? Why? So the why question is really, the what and the why question are the most important ones. Okay, we're going to come back to these steps as well and build them up as we go along. But first, I want to look at a couple of terms you may have heard in relation to blended learning, especially in K-12. Now, I know K-12 probably sounds like a planet, but it's not. Does anybody know what K-12 refers to? I'll just pause to give you a chance there. What is K-12? Kindergarten, there we go. Uh, Olesia, yes, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, says kindergarten to 12th form, exactly. K-12 is often used in North America, okay, and it's talking about primary and secondary school students from kindergarten to 12th grade. So from about, well, it could be from four or five years old, right up to 16 or 18, depending when schooling finishes in your school. Okay, uh, so these terms are often referred to in blended learning in K-12, primary, secondary, particularly in North America. And the first one there on the north, uh, on, the, on the left, sorry, is this idea of a flex model. I wonder if anybody's heard of that one. Feel free to type what that means if you've heard of it before. The flex model is probably the most kind of radical form of blended learning in that uh, it's mostly online stuff. Students, and remember we're talking mainly about primary and secondary school students and especially secondary, okay, and possibly university students here. So they're working their way through materials online at their own pace. Um, they can take different routes through it. They may be faster, they may be slower, depending on, you know, where they need more reinforcement and so on. Um, there is a teacher and the teacher can either be on site, so in the school or in the university, kind of around. The student will be usually working in a language laboratory or like a computer lab, a computer room um, in this flex model if it's taking place in the school or in the university. So there may be a teacher present or the teacher will be available at certain times. So the flex model can take place either in a school, but students are doing most of their work via computers, or from home, with students doing most of their work via computers, and then they can come into the school for office hours, if you like, with the teacher, or they can have access to an online teacher. And this model is being used quite a lot, for example, in the state of Florida in, uh, in the United States, right? They have Florida virtual schools, which are being rolled out um, at secondary schools as well. 
Okay, so that's the flex model. Um, the one below, well, let's go to the right-hand side, the station rotation. Now, this one is, is fairly, uh, it'll sound familiar if you're a primary school teacher. Basically, you're in a classroom, and you have these different workstations that are set up. So in one corner, there might be some books that the students need to look at. In the next corner over there, there's some you know stuff they have to draw. And then there's various tasks that they need to do at different stations. But one of the stations requires online work. So one of the stations will have you know either a set of tablets or a computer. And the uh, students need to do something there. So the idea is now that the students are within a single classroom. They have these different stations with different tasks. And then they rotate or they move around from station to station within the classroom. And the way they rotate can either be in small groups, and then they work through the tasks in these various stations in small groups, or the whole task, the whole class does one station's work, and then the whole class does the next station's work, and so on. So that's just a, log a logistical question. But that's the essence there. And here, uh, we're basically in the face-to-face -face classroom. We're in the, we're in the same room. Uh, and the technology is kind of brought in. But it's still considered a form of blended learning. If we go to the bottom left, then we have lab rotation. This is a little bit different. Uh, the idea is that the students are in the face-to-face -face classroom. Let's say they have a one-hour class okay, in a secondary school on maths, let's say. Uh, and then they go to a computer lab or a computer room, a separate room in the school, for 45 minutes. And they do more work on that maths or on that whatever the subject is, science or English language or language arts, they call it in North America, whatever it might be. So the students are rotating between a face-to-face -face classroom and a computer room, which is in the school, but it's doing online stuff. And this can happen you know, back and forward throughout the day. Or they might do two hours of classes, face-to-face -face classes, and then move for 45 minutes of online work. And there are a number of uh, elementary schools and secondary schools, again, in the US that have been using this model for a number of years now. One of them, for example, is called the rocket ship schools. Well worth having a look at, rocket ship schools. OK, uh, then of course the flipped classroom. That's probably the term that we use the most in English language teaching. And I'm sure everybody here has heard that term. So I'll just pause for a second so I can have a sip of my tea and also to give you uh, an opportunity to pro provide a definition of the flipped classroom there in the chat window. OK, the flipped classroom, what would that be? Thank you, Charlotte, she's put there. How would you define the flipped classroom? Students teaching stu students. Oh, that's a nice definition. OK, so Mohammed's saying all three are done in schools. They could be. The uh, station, wrote, uh, sorry, lab rotation, not necessarily, could be out of school as well. OK, there's Jo. She's saying, let me see, give students work at home that prepares them for the next lesson. Yeah. And Andrew has a similar comment there. The students do the donkey work at home, right? the mechanical learning at home and go to school to do the more interesting stuff. Yeah, and Raquel has a good point there. She says it's commonly mentioned, but there are many doubts on how to apply it. Yes, that's what we're going to try and talk about. OK, so Olga's saying delivery of content and instruction is online, which differentiates this from just doing homework at night. Yeah, I think that's the idea. It's kind of the opposite of homework, isn't it, that the students out of school do preparation, they do the donkey work, they do the mechanical learning, they find out about the kind of bricks, you know, the, the, the groundwork of the language, and then they come into school and they do the more interesting stuff, having already prepared in advance. So it's kind of back to front homework almost. And the flipped classroom tends to assume that some of that preparation work at home is done online. It doesn't necessarily have to be. There is a misconception, I think, that blended learning means you must always have online videos. This is not necessarily true. The flipped classroom is about a methodology rather than a technology. So that's one thing I'd like you to take away from the webinar. Flipped classroom is about pedagogy and methodology, not about technology. And I'm going to come back to the flipped classroom again okay, in a while. And now you'll see why I say that. In fact, it's not just me saying that. This is what um, 
this is what research says. Mohammed says, can you repeat the last two sentences? Yes, the flipped classroom is about methodology and pedagogy, not about technology. Okay, so those are the K-12 uh, models that are most commonly seen. But let's move over to ELT, where things are slightly different, I think. We, of course, still have this flipped classroom, which I've left there at the top. This idea of preparation out of class. Uh, but the models that we see implemented, or at least projects that I've worked on with schools, tend to follow one of these four, other four formats here, apart from flipped. So if we start on the left-hand side there, we have mostly face-to-face. -face. So we would have a... Um, a class which is, let's say, they have 100 hours, right? And then 80 hours are still kept as face-to-face, uh, -face, and let's say 20 hours are offered over a period of time online. But most of the class still takes place face-to-face uh, -face in the school. If we move over to the top right, we have this idea that of this kind of 50-50 blend. So maybe 50% of your course is face-to-face -face in the school, and maybe 50% is uh, done somehow assisted by technology. Okay, so that would be the half and half model, or the 50-50 model. Uh, then we, if we go to the bottom left, we have mostly online. So now we are scaling up the amount of work that we do at home, uh, usually with the, the help of technology. Maybe we do 80% of the coursework or 70% of the coursework online out of school, and we do 30% or 20% face-to-face. Uh, -face. And then, of course, bottom right, we have the fully online model where students never get together face to face. They never go into a school and they could actually be all over the world in different parts. Personally, I've been involved in fully online teacher training for about the last 15 years, um, and that can work extremely well for teacher training. Language learning is something slightly different, although there are more and more of these fully online models around. Okay, let's go back to our step-by-step -step approach to putting together a plan. Uh, the first one we already looked at, step one, which was defining your terms and thinking about why. So step two is, of course, thinking about the model. So do you want this mostly online? Do you want a 50-50 blend? Do you want mostly face-to-face? -face? Do you want fully online? And that decision needs to be made also in context, of course, right? So you need to think about who your students are. You need to find out about their interests, uh, their, their expectations, uh, the kind of access that you have in your environment. I'm going to come back to this point in a minute and what sorts of questions we need to ask. But certainly, uh, it's not a matter of, you know, this is the best blend. You should always do 50-50, or you should always do mostly online. That, that, that just is, not, is nonsensical. It's going to change depending on your students, on the aims of your course, and all that kind of thing. So there is no best blend. The answer is always, it depends, as it so frequently is. Okay, let's move on. Here are some of the key questions, I think, pulling together some of the things that we've discussed so far. If you are going to try blended learning, or if you already do it in your school or with your classes or in your institution, you should have some pretty clear answers to these questions. The first one is, what are you going to do about materials? So let's imagine we're doing a 50-50 blend, just because that's an easy number. 50% uh, online, 50% face-to-face. A 100-hour course, 50 hours are done online, 50 hours are done face-to-face. What are you going to do about the materials? Um, are you going to get your students to do like listening you know, activities online or reading activities? That's possible. They could do grammar exercises. There's all sorts of stuff that they could do online. But what is important, I think, to keep in mind is this idea of content versus processes. So when we talk about materials for blended learning, we tend to think about content, activities, stuff, reading, videos, that sort of thing. We need to remember that online can also mean process. So, for example, let's imagine that your students are using forums in Moodle, or you have a WhatsApp group set up for your students, or they're using Facebook, or they're using Twitter, or they're using some other social media platform. You can actually set tasks that work around process so that students are doing things where they're producing language all the time. Rather than student to material, it can be student to student 
and uh, worked around kind of process-based tasks. Very, very easy to do these days. We have these, you know, um, tools right there, but we do tend to forget that we can also integrate that into the online part of a blended course. The second question there is, are you adapting a face-to-face -face course to online delivery? So is it your intermediate B1 level EFL students and you've been using you know, Coursebook X for the last two years and you want to continue to use Coursebook X but you just want to do half of the stuff online? In that case, how do you adapt it? And how do you make sure that the online part of the, the content or the processes is integrated into what you do in the face-to-face -face classroom? They have to be integrated. There needs to be a link. So there's some form of continuity and the students can see some kind of point to it all. Um, and of course, that also needs to be linked into evaluation. So if you're doing a certain percentage of your course online, how is that going to contribute towards evaluation? There's no point getting students to do all this work online if then it doesn't count for anything. They're going to be a lot less motivated. And if you're doing process-based social media type tasks, how does that feed into evaluation and should it? And if it does, then there need to be very uh, clear rubrics or, or guidelines given to students in advance. And there's an argument for integrating it or not integrating it, as you can see. Okay, uh, the third point there is how are you going to deliver the online part of your course? Are you going to use a platform? Several of you before mentioned that you were using things like Moodle or uh, Edmodo, I see somebody's mentioning there, Blackboard, there's loads of them. You could use a platform, you don't need to. You could use a social media platform like Facebook or something similar. <coughs> Excuse me. The fourth point there to consider is what skills are you going to put online? Okay, so if we think of the four skills that we usually have uh, present in English language syllabi, right? We've got uh, reading, speaking, writing, listening. Which ones do you think are the easiest to put online? I'll just pause there while you think about that. Feel, feel free to type it in there. Which of the four, four skills? Yeah, Judith, grammar, yeah, and not so much language systems, but skills at the moment. So listening is one, definitely. Speaking, possibly. Okay, I see everybody's put every, every single possible skill up there. Okay, I think from my experience, receptive skills are the easiest. They really, they're just there, right? There's the listening, you know, listen to this YouTube video or watch this YouTube video, read this blog post. Uh, receptive skills are fairly easy to kind of have there. Speaking is, certainly is, it is possible to integrate it into uh, the online part of your course because of video conferencing. So using Skype or using a platform like this, you can use small groups, you can use breakout rooms. Uh, it's a little more challenging, I think, for teachers, probably less for uh, students. I think what most people do if they have a kind of 50-50 blend is that they will tend to emphasize receptive skills offline and possibly writing and then leave the classroom for communicative work, pair work, small group work, speaking. Because even with video conferencing, speaking is not quite the same as speaking face to face. Okay. Yes, and of course we have all sorts of tools there. Patricia is saying they can record themselves to practice pronunciation. Sure, all of that can be done offline. But the actual speaking, the conversation type stuff is often easiest, uh, most easily done in the classroom. So this idea of teachability is something to, to keep in mind. Uh, linked to that is, of course, task design. So how are you going to design your tasks? Are they going to be based on po content or processes or both, what we talked about before? And then, of course, the last few points are all to do with the idea of the needs analysis. So what you do and how you do it is going to be related to your students' ages, their interests, the level of learner autonomy that they have. Is it a good idea to take a class of 14-year-olds and fling them into 80% online, 20% face-to-face? I would suggest not. They're probably going to need some learner training. Then there's the whole thing of access, students' access to the internet, hardware, what do they have, software, do they need it, etc. The second last point there is that the teacher and the students' digital skills. So can they deal with you know, using certain programs or apps or whatever it might be? And then the last point, which is also extremely important, and that is attitudes. 
the, their attitudes to working online, their attitudes to blended learning, what do they expect and what do they believe about all of this stuff? This absolutely needs to go into an initial needs analysis with your students. So you can, you know, take the temperature, if you like, before you start. And if you're working with groups of teachers, this is extremely important because expecting teachers to start doing blended learning, it's not an automatic step from face-to-face -face teaching into blended, and they do need support. Okay, um, I can see there's a couple of questions coming up, but what I'm going to do is take questions at the end, if that's okay, so we don't go too much off track, okay? All right, so going back to our step-by-step um, -step approach here, we've got a third step, choosing the platform, creating all materials or sourcing your materials, creating tasks, uh, ensuring that you have interactions built in, possibly in the online part, but most definitely also in the face-to-face -face part. Okay, um, once you have all of that ready, you probably want to pilot your blended learning course with a small group. So if you're working in a university, it's probably not a good idea to try and roll it across every single class immediately. You want to start small so you can make sure that you adapt things as necessary and then roll out. I think this is a fairly standard uh, design uh, pro um, approach to, to project design. Okay, and then a fifth one, obviously, I'm sure you've predicted that, is to evaluate what you've done. Uh, to measure the learning that actually took place. I mean, did students' language improve through your term or through your year of blended learning? And also to get feedback from them about the whole experience, okay? But the measure learning, I think, is an important one. Have the students' language actually improved or has it got worse compared to face-to-face -face courses? This is something to, um, to check. And then, of course, based on those results, you're going to make changes and then roll out perhaps a slightly bigger uh, blended approach. Okay, that's fairly standard um, project design, I think. Okay. I'm going to pause here to have you think about what you do. We've looked at those different models. We had the flex model and the rotation station. I mean, it's pretty unlikely that that's used regularly in English language teaching. I certainly don't know if it's used in EFL. Um, but maybe this kind of, you know, 50-50 approach, the mostly online and so on. From your own experience, what seems to work well in blended approaches and what seems to work less well? Because that's equally interesting. I'm going to pause to let you share perhaps some of your own experiences. Right, so Patricia, for example, she's saying they've been using blended learning for six years. I'd be interested to know what sort of model you've been using, Patricia. Or models, of course. Okay, so Alan, Alison finds everyone doing different things in class with the teacher for help. Okay, that could even be a kind of a kind of a flex model, depending on how much they're using devices and what for. Okay. Yeah, so Lyndon's saying their negative attitudes to blended learning is an obstacle. I wonder if that's, is that negative attitudes from the teachers or from the students or possibly from both? Okay, some of you have tried flipped classroom. There's Stephanie. Robert's used quizzes and polls. Okay, there's a good point there from Mina. She says often the students are not interested in grammar exercises online. Yeah, and I can totally relate to that. As a student of French, I absolutely detest online grammar exercises. I much prefer watching the news. I think that's the great thing about online. You can give students um, choices. Okay, so getting students involved. Okay. Quite a few people have mentioned TED Talks during, the, during this uh, webinar as a possible uh, piece of material, I guess. Okay, videos, 
Okay, so it seems to be a kind of a mix, and most people focused on the kind of materials side of online. Remember, we talked before about materials and processes, which is the most common uh, form of blended learning, I think, in our in our profession. Okay, and we've sort of looked at what works less well, perhaps when you kind of roll out a blended approach without asking anybody, without checking uh, expectations and so on. All right, let's move on a little bit. We will have time at the end, by the way, for, for questions that we haven't answered. Okay, so I think this is the, the question, isn't it? Because, you know, why are we using blended learning? Uh, I know there's a kind of cost imperative, often at an institutional level, but really we should not be using it if it's not doing some good. So the big question is, can blended learning improve student learning? Student learning of English, of course, in our case. Uh, we have a poll here that Charlotte is going to pull up in a second, and you'll get a chance to vote. So what do you think? You should see the poll now on the screen. It says, can blended learning improve student learning? You can decide yes, no, or it depends. And you should be able to see the numbers changing, actually. And we have a kind of, yes, is kind of winning out over it depends. <laughs> We've got a couple of people saying no. <laughs> okay, it depends. Depends on the context. Yeah, a couple of couple of you are uh, explaining what you say in the chat window. Yeah, okay, Andrew. Obviously, it depends on how it's done. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, in a way, they're all correct, aren't they? I mean, I would go for it depends, but yes, it can help. And no, if it's not done effectively, then it's not going to improve learning outcomes. Uh, so that was kind of a trick question, but I think uh, I was expecting that it depends to get a higher percentage, perhaps, than we got there. Okay, we seem to be a fairly, yeah, it's, it's neck and neck, but yes is winning. Well, I wouldn't be so sure, because I have seen blended learning models that are perhaps less effective than they could be. Um, and often, teachers or schools are not really trying to evaluate the learning outcomes either. They stop at the design point. Okay, I've got it in place. That's fine, let's forget about it. But actually following up and evaluating the effectiveness of a blended learning program is extremely important. Otherwise, you can't really say yes, I don't think. OK, thanks. Should we maybe put the poll away, Charlotte, if we can just take it off the, the screen? Thanks. All right, so that's the first big question, but there is another one. If you say it depends, and we all said it depends, most of us, it depends or yes, uh, how do we design blended learning to ensure that it does improve student learning? That sounds like quite a big, scary question. Uh, and it is, because, I mean, like, where do you start? Obviously, the first question to ask yourself is, what improves students' learning? What helps students learn English? And to be able to answer that, we need to go to second language acquisition theory. And I'm going to give you just a really quick overview of what that means for blended learning. Um, basically, the first point is that the conditions for SLA, for second language acquisition, need to be present. And one of the major things that people need to learn a language is to have interaction, yeah, communication. I think uh, the research is pretty clear on that point. Interaction is key. Uh, the second point there, the 12 questions, uh, Scott Thornbury has a very nice way of kind of uh, conceptualizing how we might evaluate the effectiveness of any technology, really. Um, but he applies this one to blended learning. And these are essentially 12 questions that you need to ask yourself, one question for each of these key words. So the idea of adaptivity there is that if whether the tool allows for the kind of non-linear or incidental nature of language, because we don't learn language in this linear step-by-step -step process. So is the, the tool that you're using or the approach, the blended, le blended learning approach you're using, allowing for this? Is it allowing for adaptivity? The second one across the top there is this idea of complexity. So is there a lot of, you know, stuff related to the complexity of language in there. It's going to be grammar, it's vocabulary, it's phonology, it's discourse level stuff, it's pragmatics. Is all of that included? Are students getting that? Because language is complex. Um, the input one is clearly 
you know, pretty obvious. Uh, are the students getting input? And is it, you know, comprehensible input? Is there a lot of it? Is it reading or listening and listening? Um, can we make it more comprehensible? The fourth one there, uh, bottom, so second row on the left, uh, the idea of noticing. So, you know, is the student's attention drawn to the important features of the input? I mean, do they notice that language point? And are they helped to notice it? The idea of output going across to the right, of course, students need to produce language to be able to learn it, right? I think we all, we all know that. Uh, second language acquisition is pretty clear on that. So are we allowing plenty of time for students to have output to produce language, either in our blended online bit or in our face-to-face -face bit, or possibly in both? But it needs to happen. Also, this idea of scaffolding, how is that going to work? Uh, is there... Um, you know, do, do the activities that students do allow for them, uh, their learning to be scaffolded? Are they getting feedback? And that doesn't mean just on their mistakes or on their errors, right? I mean, on their comprehension, on their speaking. Uh, the point there about interaction. So, of course, can students interact with other speakers, maybe other learners, maybe native speakers? The idea there of automaticity. So, that's kind of what we might call the mechanical bits of language that we talked about before. So, I think most blended language programs I've seen have lots of automaticity, but it needs to be not just that. You can see that's just one element in that table. Uh, the bottom left there, the idea of chunks. So do students, are they, are they helped to learn kind of formulaic language or chunks or bits of language? Uh, the idea of personalization. So again, is the learning material relevant personally to them? Or do they make personal associations with the material? And this idea of flow. So this is the idea when you're doing something that you really enjoy. You kind of lose track of time. You get lost in it. Um, are the activities interesting and motivating enough for flow to happen? Or are they all drop-down grammar activities where flow is pretty unlikely to happen? Certainly in my own experience. So I think that sort of table of 12 points is really, really helpful when it comes to blended learning design and trying to uh, evaluate whether your own blended learning program is actually up to scratch. Is it including all of these very important second language acquisition elements, if you like? Are you covering all your bases? Under that table there, there's a point that says the teacher role and training. And this is a study that was carried out by Chris Johnson and Deborah Marsh, um, looking at teachers using uh, kind of online uh, LMS with the course book materials in that. Um, and they found, in fact, that probably one of the most challenging things was the teachers, wasn't the technology really, it was the teachers had to kind of change their beliefs about teaching. It was about the pedagogy, as I said earlier. Um, the, the teachers in the study fe felt that because students were off doing stuff online, that they kind of lost control over the learning process. So that idea of, you know, if I haven't told students about the present perfect, well, how can they possibly know about it? I have to tell them. But the way the flipped classroom in this particular study worked was the students were doing that on their own in the LMS. They were doing the mechanical stuff. And then they were coming to class for the more interactive stuff. And this was a, um, experienced as a kind of loss of control for the teachers. And this was a big deal. Uh, it meant that their roles were changing a lot. Uh, the whole belief about teaching had to be changed. Uh, and there was also quite a bit of resistance between the teachers and the students uh, to this different focus, this is kind of methodology or this uh, pedagogical shift, if you like. So this is often the biggest challenge in blended learning, not the technology. It's the pedagogy uh, and the methodology behind it. The last point there about output online versus face-to-face -face is interesting. Somebody mentioned this earlier, I think it was Mohammed in the chat, um, about students feeling less inhibited. And several studies, in fact, have borne this out, that often when students are writing, for example, in asynchronous um, forums or in WhatsApp groups or Facebook or whatever, they're typing in English, they have time, they often feel less uh, inhibited to express themselves because they can review, they can check words and dictionaries and so on. This particular study by Hodgnacki, what they did was um, compared the amount of input, uh, sorry, output um, produced by individual students in the face-to-face -face classroom versus online. And they found that the students all produced more, but the percentage of increase was higher for the kind of shyer students. So in other words, the students who spoke least in class normally 
uh, were producing more language in the online version, but everybody produced more. It's probably not very surprising if you've worked online. Okay, that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of some of the uh, theory and uh, what re researchers say about blended learning. I think this is important to keep in mind. You know, we do have to have our methodology based in uh, some sort of, you know, research and, um, you know, proof of, of whether this improves learning or not. Okay, right, that's left us almost exactly 15 minutes for questions. And I think that I have missed a couple of them coming up in the chat window. So, Charlotte, how would you like to handle the question phase? Well, thanks very much, Nikki, for such an interesting session. Um, we've had lots of questions come in, so um, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, first of all, one which I think a lot of people would like to, to know the answer to is um, from Judith. What happens if your students are not motivated to do work outside of the classroom? Sorry, can you, can you mention, I just missed the middle bit of that question. What, what would we, we do if our students are? are not motivated to do work outside of the classroom. So how, how can we increase motivation? Yeah, well, uh, I think that's a, a problem generally, right? So unmotivated students. I think task design can help with that. So coming up with uh, activities or things that they might find interesting to do online. So I think of my own experience as a learner. I'm very unmotivated when it comes to grammar exercises. So if the blended part of my course the online part consists of grammar exercises. I'm most definitely not going to be motivated, but I am motivated to read uh, and to listen to, you know, documentaries at, at a, you know, authentic language, right? Because of the level that I have, which is not particularly low, but I have high, um, much higher uh, receptive skills. So finding out, I think, what students will relate to, and then allowing them to bring that into the classroom. So in the case of my French classes, it was watching the news, watching documentaries, and then coming to class and then sharing that in small groups. Um, so there's also a connection, if you like, between what you're doing outside of class or what the student is doing outside of class and then bringing it into class. It might also, you know, it depends very much on the student. I remember having students who uh, react well or respond well to much more uh, kind of behaviorist, uh, you know, grammar translation type activities. Um, and with students like that, I've used mobile apps, which are very drill-based um, as work that they do themselves out of class, and they absolutely love it. And then they come into class and share it with everybody else. But I mean, it's not everybody's cup of tea. So allowing, I think, for a bit of differentiation there in terms of what's done online uh, is part of, part of the solution, perhaps. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's a few questions actually about um, whether you'd recommend any particular apps or tools. Um, I know you just mentioned apps. I don't know if there's any in particular that you'd like to recommend at all. Uh, well, it depends what you want and it depends what your students want. So, uh, you know, you can get apps where you could watch, for example, the BBC if that's your thing. Uh, or you can get apps like Quizlet, which I'm sure most of you in the room know. It's a wonderful way to get students to review vocabulary through flashcards. Um, flashcard vocabulary learning is one type of app-based learning that research has found to be fairly effective because part of language learning does mean uh, memorizing a certain amount of vocabulary. There's no way around that. We have to do that. We have to remember some of the words. And Quizlet is a lovely little app where you can make your own um, flashcards and you can have a definition on the back or you can have it with an image and you can play games with it. You can create them for your students. Students can create their own. Students can create them for each other. There are also lots of sets already uh, out there that you can uh, download and use. And, and it's free, of course. Quizlet, yeah, so certainly many of you know that. Uh, the whole idea of between the spaced repetition with vocabulary apps online is quite effective in terms of language learning. Other apps, I mean, I always think, I never recommend any because you need to ask your students and find out what they're interested in. But perhaps people in the chat window um, have things that they would recommend. I can see a couple of people are recommending their six-minute English. Mm -hmm. Learningapps.org for games. Quizlet. I think we've got Kahoot and Socrative as well from Raquel. I'm, I'm okay, sure and Kahoot is a ca there, so. Yeah, exactly. Socrative is a kind of instant uh, real-time polling tool. There's a number of them. 
Uh, I like one called Mentimeter, actually, which has a really nice interface, that one, Mentimeter. Mentimeter. And Kahoot, I think, is like a, um, it's a kind of a quiz thing, isn't it? Like, as far as I can recall, you can make your own sort of multiple choice quizzes and there's a countdown if I'm thinking about, or think, uh, if I'm thinking of the right, the right app. Puzzle Maker. Okay. Um, we have got another question from Francesca. Um, I'm not sure how many of the teachers in the audience are teaching young learners, but she's asked how you'd suggest to use blended learning with young learners. Yeah, I'm kind of suspicious personally of blended learning with young learners. I mean, give me a good answer to why and then okay. I mean, I'm taking the blended learning idea of having part face-to-face -face and part online, okay? Uh, the blended learning idea of bringing technology into the classroom seems fairly obvious and not difficult to do effectively and in a pedagogically sound way. But if we're talking about the type where we're going to have 50% of our course face-to-face -face and 50% online, where students are doing stuff online, I would want a very clear answer to the why. Um, some of the initiatives I was describing earlier, um, particularly in North America, with these rotational models, particularly if students are rotating in and out of face-to-face -face classes and online. The online stuff they tend to do is very uh, behaviorist-based. It's, it's mainly started off in subjects like maths, okay? And maths is a different subject to English. Um, the problem is when you try and uh, take software that has been used to maths and applied to language learning, because language learning is not linear. Mind you, maths probably isn't either. Um, but in these very lockstep, rotation-based, um, software-based approaches to learning, often students get very good at taking tests. Uh, they're often designed to teach to the test, and they become less effective at kind of critical thinking and interaction and problem solving and all of that sort of stuff. So for young learners, for this 50-50 type model, where kids are learning from home online, I'd have a big question mark over that. Great, thank you very much. I've got a question from Patricia who asks, how can we measure if the blended method is working or not? Okay, gee, I hoped I'd answered that before. <laughs> you, you take all those second language acquisition things, I'll just go back to the slide, and you apply them to uh, the design of your blended learning program, and then you look at the student outcomes. Uh, I think it's particularly interesting if you can uh, look at exam results, let's say, or the kind of work that students produce. Say they produce posters in the face-to-face -face classroom and now they're producing online posters. T try and see if there's a difference in the quantity and the quality of the language that they're producing. Uh, and that would be a good way, I think, to measure. Especially if you can do it with the same class. If you can have a baseline study with a totally face-to-face -face class who then starts some kind of blended learning model and you can compare their grades across a period of time. I mean, it's tricky to do because there are also you know, external factors that are always uh, affecting these kinds of things. Yeah, motivation and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, but still, it would be an interesting exercise. I do think blended learning programs need to be uh, evaluated, though, and they frequently aren't. I think that's, that leads me on nicely to another question from Alan Hill, who asks, how would you persuade management about the validity of blended learning? Yeah, okay, I think you first have to be clear on its validity. Uh, you need to have answered all those questions that we had before, the why question, the questions on design and so on. You need to be clear on how your design, if we go back to our second language acquisition slide, how your blended learning design covers all of these things effectively. Um, and then maybe looking at case studies that have been carried out by other teachers. So you'll see that the reference here for these particular pieces of research come from the, the Cambridge Guide to Blended Learning, which is literally trundling off the press as we speak. Um, there's a number of case studies in that which are fairly rigorous. Um, so getting management, or you know, you don't have to get them to read the book, but you could explain it to them uh, in a kind of understandable form. Uh, and then I think you know, management would usually be open to a small pilot study being started out. So if you are the teacher who's interested and keen to try it out, and you're you know you're clear on all your whys and hows and wherefores, uh, I'm sure you could get permission to try it out with one particular class, just one class of students, and then evaluate the effects and go through that whole project cycle that we talked about before. I think for in terms of persuading people, it's knowing why and being sure of your rationale and then you know, making a case 
if you like, and then presenting it to people and persuading them to allow you to experiment in a kind of small form. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you very much. Um, I had another comment from Robert who mentioned that flipped classrooms are great for bright students. Um, so it's more a question for myself, really, whether you had any advice for the sort of less able students of the group and how you can make sure that they're getting just as many benefits as the brighter students. That's that's a good point, actually. I mean, anything is good for bright students, right? I mean, bright students are bright students. You could, you know, lock them in the cupboard with a dictionary and they'd still do well, right? Maybe I exaggerate slightly. But uh, you know what I mean. So I think, you know, you could argue that depending on your task design and what you're getting students to do out of the classroom, it could benefit the less uh, proficient students because you can design more specifically for their needs, not just their linguistic needs, but also for their interests. So, you know, if you have, let's say, one student who may be weaker um, but enjoys, you know, I don't know, gaming, for example, you know, get them involved in some kind of online gaming community, but then make sure that this feeds back into the class somehow so that there are regular reports on what he's doing or what she's doing or they write it up for you in some way. But you can slightly tailor uh, the, the extra work, if you like, towards what they might actually enjoy somehow. There are plenty of studies, actually, of, of kids who go off and do their own thing online and suddenly become very engaged and very motivated. But it's a matter of finding what that thing might be. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in, um, firstly, regarding whether blended learning always has to be online. And secondly, what you can do when you don't necessarily have access to the Internet or to digital resources and how you might be able to apply some of the same principles. Yeah, we do tend to equate blended learning with online. Uh, of course, we need to distinguish between online and offline and mediated via technology. So maybe we should just say mediated via technology with or without uh, an internet connection. Because if we're talking about the mediated via technology, but offline, we could be having students using CD-ROMs, for example. Okay, So that's not technically online, but it's still mediated by technology. But if we take technology completely out of the, the equation, then I imagine we could do it just through um, text-based stuff. So that might be the workbook from the class or extra reading or whatever it might be. But we use we use printed materials, let's say. It could be non-EFL materials. It might be you know students reading a newspaper or a magazine or listening to the radio, depending on what uh, resources are available uh, in your context. But it's true, we do tend to equate the idea of blended learning with technology being involved in the equation, just because it's easier and because there's a lot of resources that students can access via technology. Great, thank you. I think we've probably just got time for one more question, which has been asked for quite a few people. We've talked about apps that you might use, um, but there's a few people that have asked about any other resources that you'd recommend, either for designing the course itself or just for helping students with blended learning. I'm not particularly. I'm also very interested that people tend to go towards the content side of blended learning, what we talked about before, content versus process. I think content out there, there is everything and anything that you could wish for in all media, you know, video, audio, text, images, absolutely everything out there. Um, so you need to find out from your students what's going to work because that's what's going to work. What matches your students' interests, level, and so on is going to work because it's going to motivate them. But I would personally be more interested in the whole process side of materials. Um, but the content side is, is one part. But let's think about how we can design the blended part to include the processes around that. How can we get our students watching, for example, the TED video? TED videos have been mentioned several times in the chat. So TED videos, let's take that as an example. How can we build processes around that for the online part or the, the technology mediated part of our blended course? Uh, where students might, you know, choose one TED video, short one, one of those eight minute ones, watch it and then send a, you know, 20 word summary to our WhatsApp group recommending it. And then let's all have a vote in the next class about which one sounded the most interesting. And let's make sure we all go and watch it, that kind of thing. So just bringing the whole, you know, at home part into into the face to face classroom and ensuring that interaction comes out of that. Lovely. Thanks very much, Nikki. I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, but don't forget that we've got plenty more webinars lined up for you, including one later this week on Thursday, which will take place at a later time of 9pm. 
where Donna Price and Gretchen Bitterlin will join us for a brief overview of the College and Career Readiness Standards for Adult Education for adult ESL students, and they'll be sharing some activities that develop the key skills of sp speaking, listening, write, reading, and writing. Next week, on Tuesday the, third, the 1st of March, Penny Eyre will be joining us to discuss her top tips for teaching and why both theory and practice are important. You can sign up for both of these and all of our other webinars on our events page, which can be found at cambridge.org forward slash ELT events. As I mentioned before, the recording of today's webinar will be live on our blog and our YouTube channel on Friday, and we'll send you a certificate on Monday. So thank you again, Nikki. Um, we've had a really interesting session, great attendance from everyone. I hope you all enjoyed it and we'll speak to hear from you again soon, I hope. Okay, thanks very much. And thank you everybody for coming. I hope it's given you some food for thought and good luck with any blending that you may be doing. Goodbye. Bye, thank you.